but uh, it's essentially just using that to generate parity and um, and then trying to figure out logically like which possibilities work and which ones don't. <coughs> so with enough known plain text, you'd be able to resolve all possible R1 and R2 pairs down to uh, you know a valid R3 register. So what this does is um, since you only have to brute force R1 and R2, it reduces it down to a 41-bit problem instead of the full 64-bit. And uh, so it's essentially 2 to the 41 times around like 6,000 clock cycles for the third. So it's a, it's a pretty big shortcut. <coughs> I've implemented this on an FPGA, and uh, it takes around 6,000 6, clock cycles for it to run. And I've been able to fit 100 cores on an FPGA running at 100 megahertz. So it'll do about 1.6 million um, tries per second. And a single FPGA will be able to brute force a, uh, a key in about 15 days. 100 FPGAs will do it in 3.6 hours. So if you guys have a bunch of FPGAs you have laying around, you know, you can pull them together and try and crack this. PCs will take a huge amount of time. Um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time trying to optimize this, but uh, I can show you a demonstration later of how how the speed compares between FPGAs and computers. <coughs> so I'll do a quick demo of this so you, so you guys can see how it works. Um, yeah, can you guys see that? Okay, sort of. Yeah. Okay, so I have. Um, of this program where um, uh, it actually takes uh, an R1 and an R2, and um, and then you put in the known output of A51. Uh, that's a typo. It says R3. Just forget about that. Um, and uh, let's see here. Um, where, where did I put that? Oh. So uh, yeah, I can I can just run this with. Uh, these different values here. And um, yeah, so, oh wait. Uh, okay, for some reason that isn't working right now, so. <laughs> but um, I'll actually just run this demo uh, Perl script that I know that works here. So let's see what this does. Um, oh, weird. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so this this uh, takes in. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, right up here you can see the A five one thing. Um, that's uh, basically the key right there. F E D C B A nine eight. And uh, 134 is the frame number. And so that, uh, uh, right after the key is mixed in, this is the value of R1, R2, and R3, right below there. And, uh, and then after like everything's mixed in and it's actually generating real A51 output, then there's R1, R2, R3. And this is actually what it outputs here. And so um, if you end up feeding in uh, a valid R1 and R2 into this uh, reverse sim application, um, and the known plain text, it'll generate R3. And so all you have to do is brute force R1 and R2. And this, this should be the only one that ever returns true, like when you use that program. <coughs> then uh, if we look down here, so assuming that that's, that's essentially how we get R3 with the known plain text, um, or get all the registers, then I have this other program that'll reverse clock uh, the three registers back to the original registers after the key was mixed in. And if you know the, the state of the registers after the queue is mixed in, then you can f clock that forward with whatever frame number you have and generate you know, the same output, decrypt any packets or transmit any packets for, for that frame number. So, um, so this, this reverse clock thing, um, it essentially tries to uh, clock the registers backwards. And, and uh, when you clock it backwards, because of the majority clocking, you're, get, you're gonna end up with possible, uh, many different possible clocking um, possibilities. And so with these three different registers, it turns out that you have all these different possibilities that 
um, of, of register states that could end up resolving to those, you know, after 100 clock cycles. So um, how we rule this out is that if you, since we have three different frames, or uh, sorry, four different frames with four different frame numbers, um, if you actually crack two of the frames and then run them, run both of them through this reverse clocking, then um, uh, so right here, I'm doing the same thing with frame number 135, where we generate the output for, for frame number 135, and then run it through this whole same process. And then we end up with these different possibilities for the reverse clocking. And uh, then you just look to see which register states match up between the two, and that's the valid one for that key. And so here's actually the valid state right here, you can see. Um, and so with those registers, that's essentially the same thing as, as the A51 key, and you can decrypt any conversations with that. And we'll, we'll be building in support into the USRP um, you know, GSM scanner project. So once you plug these values in, then you can decrypt any traffic that you want. So, um, so yeah, this, this basically just talks about how to reverse back, reverse clock um, the A51 registers. And um, yeah, you just narrow down the possibilities. So um, yeah, this talks about the two packets also. Now, uh, going on to the pre-computation attack. <coughs> uh, what we do for this is if you have 64 bits of um, output of A51 anywhere in the stream, um, what we want to do is just reverse that back to the internal state of A51 so we can run it through the reverse clocking algorithm to get back to, you know, the, the state right after the key. And so um, we basically look at, look at this like it's a one-way function, similar to like Landman or any sort of password hashing functions, where they try to make it so it's a one-way function out to the output and we're just trying to reverse back from the output to the internal state. And um, so we, we were looking at doing a rainbow table implementation to try and speed this up. And uh, <coughs> so we decided to focus on building a table of 2 to the 50, 58, which I think is one of the largest rainbow tables um, anybody's ever generated. The landman rainbow tables are roughly around 2 to the 37. And so this is uh, you know, dramatically larger, almost a million times larger than, um, than a landman table. And if you, if you look at this, it, uh, it's... 2 to the 56 is actually 1 64th of the entire key space. And because we have like all these packets, uh, we have four packets, and each packet is 114 bits. So um, we actually have uh, lots of different chunks of 64 bits inside that. If you take uh, 114 minus 64, then um, you, know, you, can, you actually have quite a few uh, bits to play, with, uh, to play with that you can possibly reverse back. And, uh, and so we have a really good chance of actually finding a key um, for those four packets with um, just 1 64th of the key space. <coughs> so I, can I see a show of hands of who knows what, how rainbow tables work or anything like that? OK, cool. Um, so this will probably be a really bad explanation, but I'll, I'll try to give it my best. Um, the, the really basic time space trade-off is you have a one-way function where it only goes a single way. You just uh, have an input into a function, you get an output, and they try to make it so you can't go the other way. <coughs> and so uh, you need to find basically the input that created the output that you have. So the really naive implementation is you go through, try every possible input, and create like a huge table, and then you search through all the outputs in the table to find the one that matches, and then you know, reverse it back that way. The, the really basic time space trade-off implementation is um, you kind of do it the same way where you have your one-way function and you feed it through you know, the one-way function. On the other side, you create a mapping of your output back to another input, and, uh, and that's called a reduction function. And then you feed it through another one-way function and you create a long chain of these. And uh, what that gives you is uh, you, you only have to store the start and the end. And then when you actually want to figure out how it works, you know, like what, uh, when you actually want to do the real-time attack, you, um, you basically create a chain from uh, whatever output you have, and you find, um, so like, uh, let's see here. Uh, 
So like, uh, if you have um, an actual value that's inside the chain somewhere, then you can just start creating um, you know, chains ahead of that at varying lengths. And then eventually you're going to find an endpoint. And, and so you just like go along until you find, um, and for every single output that you have, you ch compare it with your huge table of endpoints. And eventually you'll find the right endpoint. And then from that point, uh, you have your start point stored in there. And so then you can just like start from the start point and calculate forward until you end up right before your endpoint that you're looking for. So, um, so it's kind of like, uh, if you think of it as a one-way function, it's kind of like just storing like different kind of place markers in between. And so once you, you know, find out where you are in between two place markers, you can start at one end and then calculate forward to, to find out what resolves to you. So um, that's the basic time-space trade-off. And uh, the main problem with time-space trade-offs is collisions. Like, for example, with Landman, um, you have a password which realistically has you know, only like maybe 2 to the 37 bits of entropy. And that's being mapped up to like 2 to the 56. And so you end up with tons of collisions, um, especially when you're mapping from 2 to the 56 back down to 2 to the 37. So uh, a lot of people have worked on ways to try and reduce these collisions. Because whenever you have collisions, you end up with huge um, overlapping chains inside your, your tables. <clears throat> and then there's also possibilities of loops where you have you know, your thing endlessly go on forever. So um, one, one thing that was proposed to, to try and mitigate all these, uh, uh, all these collisions is distinguish points, where you calculate your chain until you see an output that matches uh, some sort of characteristics, like the last 10 bits are 0, or, um, or something simple like that. And then um, the one thing that's nice about that is that uh, your endpoints can be compressed because you have a lot less bits in them, uh, since all, all the last 10 bits are 0. And, um, and then you can also detect collisions a lot easier because you can just you know, compare the endpoints, and that will tell you if there was actually a collision that resulted in the same endpoints. The, the like, main method that people use nowadays is rainbow tables. And I'll go into like, exactly how all these work. Um, essentially, rainbow tables uses a different reduction function for each link in the chain. And, uh, and so the only way for actual merges to occur is for the index inside the chain to be exactly the same. The only problem with that, though, is it requires a lot more real-time computation because you have to compute every possible um, you know, like resulting chain from a given value. So at first, we tried to use distinguished points because it's a lot faster than rainbow tables. And we assumed that AFI1 wasn't very collision prone, and it turned out that it actually was super collision prone. So we scrapped all that stuff, and we tried working on some other stuff. <clears throat> we, we tried doing a rainbow table implementation, and, um, and what we ended up coming up with is uh, we can build a table that takes up about 5 terabytes of disk storage. And uh, theoretically, with one FPGA, you'll be able to reverse the key in about 5 to 10 minutes or so. And also, you can use multiple FPGAs to parallelize the cracking and make it a little bit faster. So um, with this, you can kind of like scale back, back and forth between um, you know, how much storage you want to use and how long you want it to take in the real-time phase. And so um, we're, we're still kind of working that out fully, but um, you know, it'll, it'll turn out to be pretty quick if you have the right hardware. <clears throat> we also came up with this new method for um, for doing stuff, and actually Steve um, just proposed this, and it's actually a really, really uh, cool method that might be useful for other sorts of rainbow tables, where um, you combine uh, distinguished points and rainbow tables, and uh, so basically you have like, uh, you compute one distinguished point that um, is a lot smaller than the normal distinguished point that you'd want to use, and then you take uh, that endpoint, apply a reduction function, and then compute another distinguished point, and then you know, take that endpoint, apply a reduction function, and compute another distinguished point. And so it's kind of like merging the two together. And so you get um, the collision resistance of rainbow tables and then also, you know, the speed of distinguished points. So that, that's kind of a cool method. Um, we ended up messing around with it. And it turns out that we, it seems like we'll be better off with just using the rainbow table because when we're spending, you know, months to calculate these, these rainbow tables, um, if, if we end up having collisions, it just multiplies the amount of time that we actually have to run the attack to get our, you know, get the amount of distribution that we need. <clears throat> so 
right now, the limiting factor is pre-computation. Um, 